everyone, and welcome to day 24 or 5 um, of my 40 till 40. I'm sorry I haven't recorded or uploaded in a while. I've been enjoying my journey to 40. I've been celebrating. People have been celebrating me. Um, and so forgive me. Also forgive me if you hear my dog. She's really happy to see me. Uh, and so she's jumping around and her nails are hitting the wood floor. So um, today I want to bring you a video about generational poverty um, and how I got stuck and things I did to get out. And so this video is going to be focused on, again, the fire journey, generational wealth, moving in that direction and away from generational poverty and creating a legacy for your family, okay? So I just want to, sometimes we look at people that have done things differently and maybe achieved fire, maybe they achieved um, some success, whatever you consider success. That's, that's something to start with. Like, what do you consider success? And sometimes the thoughts that we have about success really don't align with our values, our personal values. They may be values that have been given to you about what's successful. What do you feel? How do you feel about what's successful or not? We get a lot of messages about what that looks like. And so I encourage you to self-assess and say, is this really what I want? I knew uh, early on or I assumed early on because of uh, images, depictions, and watching different things, examples, um, that I thought, you know, home ownership isn't, doesn't seem like, you know, it's all that it's cracked up, cracked up to be. Because I'm looking at homeowners and they don't look like they are so happy, right? And so it's important to have really uh, successful examples, um, healthy examples of, of what you want, because you can begin to formulate thoughts and hypotheses about what you really want. So um, some habits that I had before on my road to fire, before I had financial literacy, financial uh, responsibility, financial freedom, um, some things I wanna share with you because you might be in this as well. And, and this is what I'm my personal journey. I don't know about other people, but these are the things I had to really assess to get off of that cycle of generational poverty. Now, first of all, think historically um, because, you know, it is the history of black people um, that would probably have this sticker of generational poverty on us, right? But you really have to think back to how abundant the continent that our motherland it's so abundant with all types of resources and how that has been extracted and uh, utilized and scoured and stolen first of all um, i heard someone say something about you know possessions we have right now that you know they end up in white man's museums or white men's museums. And I'm just thinking of all the things that was stripped from our, our land. And uh, fast forward to America, uh, really just the plight that our people have been through and what has put us here. And so I always say, you know, a lot of people had a head start on wealth than my people. And so this is why we are suffering for that. From that, we weren't able to own homes at one time. And then when we began to own businesses, you all know about Tulsa, when we began to own homes and land and things like that, there would be another law enacted to strip us of that. And so I would uh, really highly encourage you, not just because I'm from New Orleans, but it's an awesome museum. It's the museum, the African-American Museum of Free People of Color. And does it outline how we have been so successful, so wealthy in so many places? And with each step of wealth and success, there was something, a law enacted to 
strip us of those things. And so just thinking of the history of that, this is cycle, you know, a cyclical and generational. So here we are now with many opportunities at our, our, our disposal. However, still dealing with racism in America. So there are opportunities at our disposal, but there are still barriers. And I think we have to begin to think creatively around those barriers. And we cannot say, oh, it's because of this, this, and that. I'm very aware of the history, right? From Africa to getting onto this land in America and, and going forward. I'm familiar with the narrative, okay? And so now that I'm familiar with this narrative, it's time for me to strategically plan a way out. So I'll start with some things just from my personal life in America. Uh, and some things that I saw or things that I, I, have, uh, I had picked up that put me on that cycle of poverty. Now, this is not to, you know, um, down our ancestors or our, the people that, that reared us. Because some people might take it a wrong way and feel like, you know, a person might be ungrateful. I'm, I'm very clear that everything, my ancestors my uh, family, my forefathers did was in um, pursuit of giving me a better, better future. And so whatever they were able to creatively think of uh, to set me on that path, <clears throat> they did that. But as the changing world happens, I have this conversation with my grandmother all the time. When she says, well, I did this, well, I did this when I was your age, and I did this, and I'm like, Grandma, this is a very different world. And to apply what they did to this world, it might not work so well, okay? So I'll give you some examples of that. So uh, I believe my first, and this is important, parents, I'm not a parent, but this is, I'm speaking from when you first begin to get messages about wealth and um, what money is and, and your fiduciary responsibilities to it. So as a kid, I remember, um, you know, going to the mall every weekend, going to Macy's and shopping every weekend. And so what are we conditioning our kids to think? This is what you do. You go and you, you know, go and get your nice threads from Macy's and you, you know, to be presentable for work, for school, for, you know, events and things like that. Um, I know this is not just personalized to me. This is many, you know, black households, you know, um, getting our nails done. Our appearance is very uh, important to us. We express ourselves through our appearance as well. So, you know, your hair, your, your jewelry, your, your makeup, your, your nails, and, and all of these other things. Um, we're a very creative people, and we, we really wear our essence. Uh, it comes through, you know, from the inside out. So knowing how important that is. But remember, we need to question whose values are these and what image are we going for and, and looking uh, for here. Uh, and so um, I remember seeing my, my family um, going to the nail shops, you know, getting manicures, um, and things like that. I remember seeing some family members um, had homes. You know, they were homeowners. Um, some other things you can think about, you know, vacations, whether people took vacations, what type of vacations did they take um, as well? And so what are you really, you know, teaching? Your, your, you're teaching your child, you know, what type of lifestyle and what success and things like that looks like. Um, what are some conversations you're having about money? You know, we think about allowance. Um, we think about whether you, you worked or not or had to work for what you, you wanted or needed. Um, and again, just watching the people that were responsible for you, how their lives were, were run. And so I was really fortunate because I had, you know, one side of the family operating in a very different way. And I had another side of the family operating in a very different way. So I I got to see both ways of how families um, operated and, you know, could clearly see 
you know, I think I might want to operate this way because I see how this family is and I see how this family is and this is the one I want and things like that. You also begin to see, uh, you know, education being important. And this is so important for the black family, I think, um, a big focus on education. Uh, and so one thing that I would change um, and maybe not change at the same time is going to a four-year university. Now, I had a four-year scholarship, athletic and academic. However, I know a lot of people rack up a lot of uh, student loans at this time. And I did as well because, well, I simply didn't keep the GPA that I should have. Um, and I lost some of the money, not all of it, but some of it I disqualified myself for. And so I started getting into loans. And you know, also in college, they're looking to eat you up with the credit card debt. And so um, I got into credit card stuff, you know, trying to keep up with everybody. I wanted to, again, go to Macy's or go, every, you know, get, go shopping every weekend. Now, I wasn't going to Macy's. I was going to Rainbow, you know, little stuff like that. And so... That was what I was, you know, you're, you should have new, new clothes, you know, at school, you know, you need to look good. You know, I had a little job, you know, you want to look good at your job. And, you know, I had the privilege of, of actually working um, in a corporate uh, government job where, you know, I needed to dress up and, and things like that. And so I didn't have a uniform, you know, or anything like that, like a restaurant or a fast food place or you know, things like that. And so, um, so I thought that's what I should be doing. Now, you have to think about this misplaced thought of, you know, your parents or grandparents or your guardians that might have, you know, the jobs that could afford that or not, many times not. Um, and you as a young person trying to keep up with that, like, I didn't have the income to really do that, to, to afford to buy things, clothing whenever I wanted, but I did it, right? And so I also wanted a new car. I was, I was adamant about getting a new car. I had a beautiful used car, a Honda Prelude, 1988 Prelude that my family bought me and um, they got it all nice. It was candy coated with the sparkles in it, red and, you know, with the, the, the moon roof or the sun roof. I mean, it was like sporty. I loved it. But oh, when I got to college, I wanted a new car. And that new car came with a $343 car note. And who let me get that? You know, we, we don't say no to, to our kids about bad decisions. And so although I was, um, my father did tell me that's not a good idea, I insisted and and he co-signed on it. And so, um, you know, here I am now have to try to figure out how am I gonna pay a $343 car note, insurance. I want to be on my own, so I left the dorm. I wanted an apartment. Uh, so I, now I have rent and I have this $10 an hour job, you know, that was pretty good for them because I wasn't making minimum wage, but oh my goodness, you know, these were some of the mistakes and the pitfalls, right? And um, I hadn't learned earlier on about these things because I just saw, you know, people having stuff, right? I'm supposed to have these things. My family had nice cars. You know, I should have a nice car too, right? And so um, these are the things, again, that we're teaching without, without saying it, you know, what we're teaching. And then we're, we're not teaching. There's things that we are saying, right, uh, through our actions. And the way we live, that might not be very good for our family to know. And there's things we're not saying that they should know, right? And so um, I think starting really young, I, I watch a YouTube that um, this family that, you know, have children and they're on their, you know, on their journey to fire or they've reached fire and their children are investors now, you know, young, you know, already investing and having businesses and things like that, you know, they go to, they're millionaires now, but they go to, you know, the thrift shop and, you know, grab their polo shirts and their designer stuff, whatever you want to say, right? Um, but these kids are excited about looking through their portfolios and their stocks and their businesses and, and growing their YouTube channel and things like that. You can see 
the shift in what's important, what their parents have shown them. So they watch, they're watching their parents. Hey, my parents, you know, flipped houses. They, they, they renovated houses. They're, they're doing Uber. They watch their parents on this fire journey, like doing all these things to get them comfortable. And now they get to enjoy all the benefits of the comfort that their, their parents put in that work on the beginning. And, and um, now they do travel and they do all of these different things. Um, but they have to see the hard work too. Like, you know, they would be involved in the projects. Like if we're painting, you're painting, right? And things like that. And so uh, watching their parents live out fire they have a different set of values of what's important. Uh, so this four-year college thing, um, I think that uh, I would have maybe done a, a community college that could maybe have offered me a free education um, with the same degree. But I will say I attended a historically black college and university in HBCU that offered me um, more than a degree, right? Offered me pride, uh, leadership, heritage, uh, something I just probably could not get at a white institution or sometimes a community college. And so my thoughts are that maybe there's something else missing where uh, we're, we're getting that from an institution, HBCU, versus in our community, right, from our family. Um, th those, those, that, that pride, that culture and things like that. And so... Um, it can be a pretty penny. Uh, I think it's a great investment for, again, the black person. Um, however, that degree is the same degree that, you know, everybody else has. And um, I don't remember anyone, you know, hiring me because I went to the HBCU, right? And so I'm not knocking HBCUs. Sometimes we do need that. But I want you to just think differently about maybe... Um, going straight there. And also I've talked about in the past in, in my social media, even uh, only making that the choice. We say college, 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 but millennials, please thumbs me up and, and let me know we are the most indebted. We, we are so in debt, be, debt because of school. And uh, we, we pu were pushed that college was going to set us free. And at one point, this may have been the answer, but in this climate, we're drowning. And then uh, what's pushed is then home ownership. I can't afford a home if I already have six-figure debt from college, right? And so um, there's some order of how you do that as well. Um, and I found that out the hard way um, that don't push home ownership on me and I have six-figure debt in loans, uh, student loans. I cannot afford a home. Right. The bank might tell me I can. Right. Because they don't consider uh, student loans, especially if they are um, not in default in qualifying you. But I am getting further and further in debt here. Right. And so that might not be what you want. So uh, I did uh, buy a home and I did uh, also experience um, having a, a tenant. When I, I moved out of that home, we rented the home and um, had a rental income and being able to use it to offset taxes and the benefits of it and things like that. Uh, but I would say I still wasn't ready for home ownership. Um, and so a lot of us aren't, but that is the gold standard of success that we bought a home. No shade to anyone. But just know there's an order to things, right? You can definitely... Uh, invest and be renting and that's that's success too right don't look at your friends like oh they own in this home or land or you know they have you know businesses or they're investing you know you have to figure out what works for you so at the time um i can tell you when i bought a home i i had debt you know and i had credit card debt that was up the behind and I saw some things that were happening in my life that were not um, helpful, um, such as I tried to apply for a job and my credit was so shot that I couldn't get this job. Yeah. And so um, that, that was an issue, you know. So um, 
So some things I've done and, and have rethought. I remember that Black Friday was a really big deal, you know, in my family. We would go and be ready for these deals early in the morning. Now, you know, it's on the day before uh, you go be before Black Friday on that Thursday. Now they do, do it early and um, to just spin up your money because there's major sales on uh, electronics and all of this. This again is materialism, consumerism. Someone told you you needed a bigger TV. Someone told you your kid needed another video console, you know, um, and you're buying it and it's depreciating and um, it's a cycle. So I just remember when I just was really uninterested in going to spend my money on Black Friday on things I didn't need. And so, um, or just, I don't go shopping just because I have to go shopping. I have tons of clothing and my clothing is not, I, I take pride in my clothing looking really nice and I don't pay a lot for it. So this dress, people might really like, people love it. It was 10 bucks. And so, um, I'm really thoughtful about, you know, does this support my journey? Why? Why do I need this? I'm thinking of uh, my shoes. I, I washed them. We went to Mexico. Uh, we went to uh, Playa del Carmen and we went to a water park or something and my shoes got all funky. And so I put them in the, my tennis shoes, I put them in the washer and the dryer and I must have dried them like 5,000 times because it kept kicking the dryer open. And then I see my shoes coming apart like, oh my goodness, you know. And again, I'm thinking, okay, how can I keep this pair of shoes? Like, oh, you know, maybe I can get them glued back in. And um, I remember the first thought I thought was, I need new shoes. And then I was like, hmm, do I though? And so uh, I joked with my boyfriend and, and someone else about, I'm waiting until this toe pop out. I'm not buying, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's a really... It really feels good when it's a choice that you have to, you know, it's a privilege to have a choice to, you know, uh, wear whatever you want to wear, whenever you want to wear. But I, I just want you to think about um, some choices, some, some, some things that keep us in generational poverty, doing things the same, trying to apply the same, um, the same things that maybe people did in the past to this climate now. Uh, really doesn't work. And again, I'm talking specifically to my uh, to to millennials who are in in major debt because of student loans, and you know, buying a home, being told that's important. You probably by your parents or your grandparents, like why you don't own a home, and maybe you know they may look at you like you're unsuccessful because of that. Um, and uh, it would do nothing but put you where you would be sitting in that home doing nothing. Like you don't have, you can't do anything else. And um, times have just changed. And so uh, rethinking, rethinking, uh, wow. Rethinking what, um, what, we're, what we're sending off, uh, selling uh, without saying anything, but people are watching our lifestyles uh, and choices and um, what we may not be talking about and, and saying. Um, and it's, it's, it's a difficult road, I, I can imagine. There's, there's so much against us as far as uh, conditioning and messaging. Um, so it's, it's not an easy road to, um, to do it, but... Um, like I said, I've been there in the deep credit card debt, student loan debt, uh, couldn't get a job because of my credit, you know, was, was, um, approved for housing. Um, at the time it was like 2008, it was like $500,000 I was approved for. I couldn't afford that, you know, um, but the bank gave it to me, you know. Um, one other thing before I go... I uh, about getting out of out of out of this uh, cycle. I remember putting ten and twenty dollars into my when I first started. Um, I first started investing at about uh, at two thousand thirteen, so not very uh, you know early as I could have, and I didn't know what I was doing. I just was putting ten and twenty dollars into this account. They were telling me to put in at work. And I remember looking at it, it was like 3000 maybe, no, it was 6000 or 12000 or something at some point. And um, I wanted to buy a car and I said, uh, 
um, I wanted to buy a car ever since the, two, the, the new car with a $343 note. I had written off buying new cars and, and having car notes. I did not want to do that. And so my it, every car after that, I don't think I've had a car note ever. And so um, that's how miserable I was trying to keep up with the Joneses, okay? So I learned that lesson early. But um, I remember I went on a lot and, and I wanted to buy the car right out. And, and I don't know why or how or whatever. These sleazy salesmen sometimes, they, they were to like, oh, you can finance it. You know, maybe I, I was looking at a car that was a little bit out of my budget. And he was like, you can finance it, you know, or something. And I was, he was like, finance some of it, pay some of it. And I, was, and I, I fell for it. But I, uh, instead of going with their finance, and I looked into my, you know, credit union. And um, at the time, they gave me a 3% uh, interest rate. And um, I borrowed 3000 instead of them giving it to me, the, the, uh, the down payment or whatever. I borrowed three thousand from my uh, retirement account with my job, and I learned that I could pay myself back without interest. And so that was something I didn't know that I could do. And so I borrowed three thousand for the down payment, and the three percent loan for the car allowed me to pay. It allowed me to have car car payments of one hundred and twenty three dollars or something like that. Something I could do very easily. So instead of paying 120 something, I was paying 300 or 200. I was paying more, you know, to get it um, down. And I paid that car off so quickly. And I still drive that car. And uh, it's in pretty good shape. Um, so I drive a 2006. And uh, I have no desire to buy anything that's going to depreciate and um, still very, very adamant about not having a car note. And so when I became free of that car note, I felt good about that, you know, but I felt good about that decision, like, oh, great, you know. Um, but those are some things you need to think about. So when I was not knowing what I was doing with investing and I looked up and saw that account, just 10 and $20 out my paycheck would led me to, when I look back at it, I had about six or $12,000 in there. I was like, whoa, okay, this is something. I don't know what I'm doing, but okay. And so then I started increasing it and then it moved to 50,000. You know, I looked at it and I'm like, "Ooh. Wow." And so as you as you um learn more, you'll be more intentional about what you're doing. So now, you know, I have outside investments outside of my job. Most the ones that I do, I like low-cost brokerage is um Charles Schwab, Fidelity and Vanguard and um I'm a passive, what they call a passive investor, you know, kind of a set it and forget it, that the market will do what it does over five, over 10 years. And so, you know, looking at it every day, I'm not a day trader. And I, and I watch people on social media talk about single stocks going up and down that they're watching. You know, that is kind of like a gambling game and you can lose your money real soon with gambling with the stock market. About seven, seven out of 10 people that, uh, day trade are not successful. Now, there are successful ones, but um, know what you're doing. It's not about watching your Walmart stock, watching your Tesla, your American Airline, whatever, your, your one stock, right, uh, that goes up and down so you can lose your money. That's like a gambling thing, right? And it's you're watching it from day to day. Uh, if, if that's not your day job and that's all you're going to do, that's very unsuccessful and very, it's not going to grow you uh, major wealth, you know, and then you pull out whatever your gains are and then, you know, all of this kind of thing. So determine what type of investor you are and, um, and then move from there. But educate yourself. Do not follow the trends on social media, what people are doing and, and things like that. And so um, that's all I have for you today. I just want you to think differently. You know, you don't have to follow my path. You know, you don't have to follow someone else's path. Determine what is important to you and what uh, resonates with you, okay? Um, that's all I have for you today. So I'll see you uh, another time. And until then, peace.